I'm Carmine Gallo, and it's an honor today to be speaking to Darren McBurnett. He is a retired Navy SEAL, a combat veteran, and a fine art photographer. We're talking about this gorgeous new book that he put together called Uncommon Grit. It's a photographic journey through some of the toughest Navy SEAL training uh, taken by uh, someone who's lived through it and who's actually an instructor. <laughs> Hello, Darren. It's quite an honor to meet you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. I, it's that's the best to be been on Veterans Day. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I I say it's an honor, and I mean it because I don't think that the average person understands the uh, the special forces. I have an amazing opportunity to have spoken to different elite groups within the military, and the what most people maybe don't see is the the skill the discipline, the courage, they really are uncommon. Yes. <laughs> Exceptional yes. elite warriors. <laughs> and, and you're elite too. You served with the Navy SEALs for 24 years, 49 mm -hmm. honors, including a bronze star. Thank you. Oh, it's, it's, uh, I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You know, and what, what I like to tell people, that's me putting my liberal arts degree hard at work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you that, how you got into photography, <laughs> because that, that's an interesting career path. Uh, yeah. Let's look at these two words, uncommon, mm -hmm. grit. Uncommon meaning out of the ordinary. Or out of the ordinary, yep. Mm -hmm. Grit. What does mm -hmm. grit mean to you? Just to, the, to, to me, it's, it's the intrinsic characteristic that you have of just, just grinding it out and, and uh, moving forward in the, uh, in the, in the hard, in the just just the hardships of life, you know, it's like, that's what grit is. It's a, that's, and you know, that's how we define it in the book, right? In the beginning, we put the two definitions back to back, you know, uh, because that's what it is. It's an, it's an uncommon characteristic, you know? And so it, it took about three months to come up with the name of uncommon grit, but uh, I, I, I love it. I love it. All of these photographs are from the first four weeks of yes. what's called BUDS training, which is the first four weeks of basic conditioning. BUDS stands for uh, basic underwater demolition slash seals, right? Yes. BUDS training. Yes. Yep. And then it culminates in what a lot of people have heard about, which is hell week. Is that where you lose most of your candidates? Actually, what, 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 whoever's going to quit is, is gonna, probably going to do it at, at hell week. And the thing about it is it's, it's uh, you'll believe it or not, the amount of guys you lose up to hell week is, is staggering. Uh, but one thing you got to remember, it's only the fourth week. You still got 22 more weeks to go. Then a whole nother year of SEAL qualification training, then a whole nother year of a workup with a SEAL platoon, then a deployment. So, and all these candidates are highly screened. Not like when I went through, I'm like, huh, what, what SEAL, what, what is this? Yeah. You know, um, these guys are highly screened from all over the country. And so, uh, they're all tough. They're, they all have resilience, you know, they're, they're all, Bodies are built harder in Chinese algebra. I mean, they just show up and they're just raring to go to be uh, Navy SEALs. And then like the days go on, they just quit. You lose probably more than half your class by the time you get to hell week. And then you lose another 30, 40% after that. Darren, that's why I'm really glad that you put them into photographs because I find it so hard to describe the physical and the mental challenge of going through those first four or five weeks and, and hell week. I think one statistic puts it in perspective and tell me if this is correct. During the five and a half days of hell week, you get something like four hours of sleep. Yep. That's correct. Total. Yeah. Total. total. <laughs> not every day, not every night. Total. I, total. I don't even understand how you can, how that's even physically possible. Yeah. I don't either. I'll be honest with <laughs> you. But you made it. <laughs> you know, we, we, it. It happens six times a year. You know, I mean, when I first heard about Hell Week and I'm in Buds, it's like, I can barely make it through the day. We're doing what again? We're doing this all day and night for five and a half days. And I think mentally that crushes a lot of people because you're thinking about that because how hard it is during just one day and then just like keep going night, day, night. It's like, it's why the SEALs are the only one that they, uh, SEAL, is the only one, the uh, SEAL program is the only one that does it. You know, and it's, it's that it's the reason we do that is we want to see how far you can go. You know, we want to see how far your potential is and you'll be astonished to see how far that you can actually go and do things when you're actually pushed and tested, you know, so many people just, you know, uh, uh, just stop 
you know, when they, when they start to hurt or do it, get to like 24 hour mark, but that that's the, it's a war between your ears is what's happening. You know, it's like, you never know what you can do unless you physically like are, are, uh, uh put one foot in front of the other. So Darren, as we, I, I didn't think I was going to make it through, to be honest with you. I'm like, what the, I, I looked at that, this huge obstacle, like, wow. As we, as we look through some of the photographs as we're talking, can you help us understand just from uh, a physical and mental uh, perspective how intense Hell Week is? Uh, it's, it's your, your number one, it's, it's more mentally tough than anything, I'll be honest with you, because first of all, you're always shivering and you're always cold because you're always in the water, you're always moving, and that's another thing. And so that's what makes it really, really hard because you're constantly moving. Even when you're um, just you know, going to get something to eat, it's like, three, it's like a mile and a half to get something to eat. You could have been three miles down on the, on the strand carrying your, carrying your log or your boat, and you got to run all another four miles back, grab something to eat, you keep going. And, uh, and you're just moving and moving and moving. And, um, and that's mentally tough on people. It's like, how, are we ever going to stop? You know, <laughs> it's like, no, you're going to keep going. And uh, it, it, it's, it's definitely mentally challenging. And there's you know? sand, no, always sand. sand, always sand. Every, uh, we don't have to get into details, but uh, you know, do you take a shower <laughs> or does it just get everywhere? Yeah, it just goes everywhere. You know, when you hit the surf, it all wipes off, but you do uh, every morning for about, uh, you get about a three minute uh, a rinse off yeah. uh, in, a, in a cold shower, of course, your boat crew, yeah. whoever's left goes through, they get a quick medical check to make sure you don't have the flu, make sure you can walk, nothing's broken, uh, put some uh, 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 antibacterial cream on all your chafing, you know, and then you, then you hit what's called an ice boat. I've got some pictures in it with big chunks of ice that actually feels really good, you know, and then because it's like, oh, all the snot bubbles, tears and sweat finally get out of your eyes. And then, then you go right back out. And so you pretty much get one, one small freshwater winds a day and then that's it. And, and again, you, it's this sleep deprivation, right? Darren? Yep, that's so the big thing. You were an instructor. Tell us what is the purpose of all that? The purpose of being an instructor is to find out who, and this is going to be interesting. It's like, who are you going to be, who are you going to want that, that qualifies that you're going to be in that platoon with you? Because that's the thing about SEAL instructors. I, of course I was on my last to go retire, but there was guys in there that are going to go back to the SEAL teams. Instructors are going to be uh, SEAL platoon leaders. They're going to be uh, uh, leading petty officers. They're going to be running platoons, you know, and when they, when he got guys running with the logs, running with the boats, uh, doing all the timed evolutions, doing the drown proofing, they're looking at these guys going, which ones are, are going are gonna to do good in my platoon that I'm going to leave here in another year? You know, so you're not just, they're not just students coming in out. You never see them again. You're actually not only going to see them, you're going to deploy with them. You're going to go to war with them. So that's a big, big difference. Okay. So in this sleep deprived state, mm -hmm. uh, the, the candidates are assigned a boat crew and yes. there are leaders who are people who are chosen. You're a captain for one crew or another, and sometimes they switch off. So as an instructor, and, and this is going to be very instructive for all of us in business mm -hmm. too, as leaders, what are you looking for? We're, we're looking for a lot of things. Number one is the most important thing is, is how do you treat every other guy in that boat crew? Okay. One of the biggest rules of thumb that you'll always get is number one, you can't do it alone. That's A. Number two is when you stop caring about yourself and you care about more about your boat crew, then that's, that's what clicks because you, you can't do it by yourself and you're all in it together because you fail together. You're going to fail together, succeed together, succeed together, you're all one team. That's what makes us who we are. And so when you're, when you're, look, when you're in that boat crew, when you make that transition, because a lot of people, uh, even when they get to that point of hell week, they're still thinking about themselves. They're still thinking about being the gray man. It's like, Oh, what, what can I do to not be seen or, or, or just take care of myself. And it's like, you got to let that go. You know, it's like, Hey, because one of the big things I didn't want to quit, because if I quit, then I would leave that log. And that's one less guy on that log. That's more pain for them. That's more, uh, uh, it's more chance possibility for them to fail. And so we didn't want that. I didn't want that kind of conscience. <laughs> so and so you just keep going. And those are the traits that we're looking for. And you, you can see it. Of course, you're going to argue a little bit back and forth in that boat crew. And, but, but in the end, that's what we look for. And those guys that actually come together and it's like, hey, we need to succeed together. And it's going to take all of us. Uh, those are the traits we look for. And the guys that don't are the guys that quit. Tell me how that applies to business. So as a business leader and an entrepreneur, 
What can I take from that? Well, you can take from that. How can I be that type of leader? <laughs> well, think it is what you can take from that. It's like, think of that log, that 400 pound log or that 200 pound boat over your head and you got seven guys. Okay. That for us, to me, that log represents the SEAL teams. That log represents uh, my platoon. That log represents America. And so, and it's hard and you have to move forward with the job that you're going to do. You can't drop it. You can't just quit. You just can't let go. And it takes all of you to move forward. And that's what that represents. And so, and you, again, you realize that you all, you, you're all in it together. It's like, you cannot do it by yourself, you know, and you all, you, and you all di equally distribute that weight. You all have a job to do, and then you move forward with it to, for mission accomplishment. You know, there's, you can't have individual uh, individuality out there doing your own thing. One just going off to do a thing and coming back all hands on that log at all times. And that's, what's going to ensure mission success. Thank you for explaining the log because there are a bunch of pictures in there in your, in your book of, of men carrying uh, this very heavy, it looks really heavy, like you said, 200 pounds or more, a, a log. Mm -hmm. And I, I, the first thing I thought about there and was that Navy SEALs, when they execute a mission, they have, they are equipped with the most advanced military technology available. Why are we carrying logs around on sand <laughs> berms? <laughs> well, I think for the most part, because number one, it sucks. <laughs> But yeah, for two, yeah. uh, <laughs> but for two, it's 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 how we teach teamwork right off the bat. You know, it really is because when you're when you're uh, a candidate at SEAL training, especially the first uh, three or four weeks leading up to Hell Week, you know, we have timed evolutions. As a lot of it, you know, is is individually based. You do the test gates. You have to pass the O course. You have to pass the runs. Uh, uh, you have to pass the physical conditioning. We want to see how you perform. But also, you're going to be working with the boats and the logs. But um, but I'm telling you, once we get to Hell Week, you know, that's like, that's where it really pushes forward because you really have to work as a team during Hell Week, you know, and, uh, and that's why we give them the logs, you know, because number one, it's painful. And two, it, you're going to see how you're going to react. Not only are you going to see how you react when you carry a log and you work with other guys, you're also going to, now you're sleep uh, um, deprivation sleep, at this yeah. point. Sleep yeah, you can't. deprived, right? Yeah, you're, you're trying to hard stay awake. You're all exhausted. You're wet. You're cold. You're shivering. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you're, it's like being comfortable, being uncomfortable, you know, but in the end, that's what you're doing. You're going to move forward with some of the hardest missions out there that you're going to get and you can't quit, you know, and you, and you, and you, and you get a count, you're going to look to the left of you you're going to look to the right of you. And those are the guys you're going to go to those missions with. And so, um, and no man left behind, no it's land left ethos. behind. Yeah. And it's, and, and it's hard. It's not, we have a hard job. And so if you want to do the hard thing, if you want to do the hard job, you got to do the hard things. And it just doesn't mean being physically hard and that you can do all these things. It's being mentally tough and understand that you, you, you all have to do it together. Darren, you've mentioned sleep deprivation. What, why the sleep deprivation? Boy, that's a great question. You know, <laughs> well, for the most part, you have to see how far you can go because the biggest thing is you never know when a mission is going to end. You know, you, you never know. And so you can get tasked with something. You could be out there for two weeks. You can be out there for a long freaking time. And so it's not like you can go uh, sneak back in and like curl up in your sleeping bag and sleep for like another eight hours to get up and keep going. It's mm -hmm. like, no, you don't, you never know what's going to end. And that, that's, well, that's one of the biggest takeaways of that is missions just, just keep going. And so we got to know how far we can push ourselves, you know, um, before we can get to that lim that limit of no return. And, uh, and, and you can't teach, you, well, we kind of can teach it in Hell Week, but, you know, you're never going to know if you just do like a couple days or we're going to do some stuff that's really hard just for a couple days. It's like, no, let's just go in a weekend. Let's just go like a, a, a little over a week uh, and, and see how that works. <laughs> Darren, can you explain this photo? Mm -hmm. These men have been thrown into a pool with their hands and their feet bound together. Uh, th that's it. I'm out. So, <laughs> I, I will, I will never be in, invited, uh, <laughs> nor will I seek out <laughs> SEAL training ever yeah. after that. But, so I would advise everyone before you uh, decide on whether or not you want to be a SEAL, take a look at that photograph and then yeah. just, uh, explain, well, please. You know, it's like, you know, one thing uh, we like to talk about is stress you know, uh, high risk environments and stress. So, so what's the, what's, what's the thing that we can teach ourselves how to deal with stress right off the bat? Because you can deploy, you know, there's bullets flying and people trying to, uh, uh, trying to end your life. And, uh, so what's the first thing you can do? Well, take away air number one. 
and oh, two, tie your hands and feet together. Now this is a controlled environment, yeah. but it's a first step into uh, to dealing with stress. It's like, what are you going to do? So for us, it's like you can panic or go to the top or have a circuit pull you out, or you can work the problem. Okay. It's, it's, it's actually very, if you're calm down, you know, obviously take some breaths, figure out wh what you're doing and you, you can survive the evolution. And, and that's what it's all about is, is that, is that inject of stress right off the bat. And you're going to see how you deal with it. Cause you're gonna have to be able to problem solve when the, uh, when the, the, the stakes are higher with stress. And so that's, that's kind of like the lead up in first phase with all the evolutions that deal with the water. You know, we want to see how you work together. But number, number two, how can you solve the problem while we're giving, while we're, we're adding stress to, to the problem? All, all traits and skills that corporate leaders need more than ever. Are you going to throw them in a pool <laughs> with a pants tied? <laughs> yeah. You know, without getting, uh, without the physical part, but yeah. uh, you know, the, <laughs> yeah, but you were, you were mentioning the panic, you know, the pa I, I think you called it panic proofing. Yeah. Panic proofing. Which again yeah. is how to deal with, with stress um, and how to deal with those uh, chaotic situations that are inevitably going to come. And, mm -hmm. and if it's the first time that you've ever, I, I remember speaking to astronauts, they do the same type of training where the reason why they can remain calm, like the Apollo 13 astronauts, yeah. the reason why they can remain calm is because they've already practiced uh, that crisis thousands mm -hmm. of times before. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's what we do all throughout first phase. You continue doing out on the SEAL teams too. You know, it's, 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 it's has to be, it's like, if we're going to put you in panic situations, we're going to put you in stress situations and it's your job to like move on and do your job. You know, it's there, but Hey, now I'm saying we're not going to be fearful or be afraid at times, but Hey, this is our job. This is what we do. Darren, SEALs are trained to remain calm in chaos. What can business leaders and entrepreneurs adopt from SEAL training to elevate their own leadership skills and to lead more effective teams? Uh, the big thing, my, my answer to that would be uh, probably one of the basics of, of any unit or, or team is remember who you are. You know, um, a good example is what's going on in our world now. It's like the battle space is, is definitely changing, you know, and so how are you going to adapt and overcome to that battle space? You know, uh, in the SEAL teams, you know, every year there's a different battle space, whether it be Kosovo or Liberia or Africa or Afghanistan or Iraq, whatever's going on, you know, that battle space is changing. Your standard operating procedures are changing. You know, your, uh, um, your, your, your environment is changing, your tactics are changing, the people that you're going against are changing. And so it's a constantly moving battle space. And it's, it's your job to remember who you are. It's like, okay, this is just a different battle space. Who are we? Right? We're Navy SEALs, we're America's elite. So let's, we're special forces. This is what we do. We adapt to that battle space and overcome and, and move forward. But never forget, we, like in the battle space change, we never stop being Navy SEALs. You know, so in the corporate world, you haven't stopped being who you are you're still doing the same job. The battle space has changed. It's like, okay, that's where you dig deep. It's like, all right, battle space has changed. How are we going to adapt to continue to be who we are without changing? And people can, are still coming to us with confidence. So that, yeah, that reminds me of something. Okay, so I, I've written a lot about leadership, uh, written 10 books on, on leadership. And so I, I, I've had this amazing opportunity to speak to some great leaders in the world. That reminds me of purpose. Okay, I call it purpose. Uh, great leaders who effectively manage teams through crisis or chaos remind those teams constantly, even before a crisis occurs, mm -hmm. of who they are, what is their purpose and their mission in the organization or company. Mm -hmm. It's very similar. Yeah, you know, uh, what we've done is in the sales teams, you have to create a culture, you know, you're creating a culture of success. You know, and that, and that's, and that's, that's just one of the ingredients, you know, uh, another ingredient for what we have as you're moving forward is, is accountability. You know, if you got accountability, then you got pretty much accepted responsibility of what you're doing. And then you got credibility and you have trust. And the biggest thing is trust when you move forward. Can we all trust each other and can leaders trust each other? And can they trust you? It's like, yes. And so it's kind of like a small little formula that we have is do we look left, we look right to one another. We've been through all the training, we've been through stressful situations, but do I trust that guy next to me? Do I trust the guy to the left of me? And do I trust my leadership? And the, and the answer is uh, 
every time 100% yes. So let's move forward and, 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 uh, and get mission success. That's really fascinating. Uh, the one thing I've, I've wanted to ask a military you know, hero like yourself, uh, especially, <laughs> especially recently, I've, uh, a lot of people are living in this very anxious world. You know, there's, there's crisis, we're anxious, we're depressed, we're angry, we're frustrated. Uh, but I've, I've learned through, especially my reading of history uh, from George Washington and all uh, other great military leaders, that even though behind the scenes, they may feel uh, worried or, or anxious about a particular mission. When they're in front of their team, they put on a brave face. Is, is that something, should leaders exude confidence, even if uh, you know, perhaps personally they're feeling a little uneasy about the situation? <laughs> well, if, if, if your leadership is sitting up there and they're worried, then in a SEAL team, we need to be very worried if they're worried. <laughs> yeah. well, that's exactly but, it. Everyone is going to have a feeling of uneasiness yeah. or worry or anxiety. But yeah, I, I, I assume you, we don't, you don't show it. You don't want to show that to other people, right? Because it's an emotion. No. It's contagious. Yeah. It really is. You know, um, I've, I've never really had any leaders in the SEAL teams walk in the SEAL platoon and go, all right, um, this is not good, but we're going to go ahead anyway. It's never that. Right. You're like, oh my God, you know, but even, but that's, but again, it's our job. It's our job to, it's our job to run into danger. And yeah. so instead of like, okay, this may not be good odds, it's going to be, okay, what's our intel say? And we start breaking down what it is. It's like, okay, this is this mission. It's going to be highly dangerous. What's intel say? Okay, let's start working backwards. What's everything that can go wrong? Okay, this can go wrong. This can go wrong. This can go wrong. You start working those contingencies and working up. And it's like, okay, let's go do it. But, but if, if a leader comes into your still space and is worried about a mission, we're probably not going to go on it. You know, <laughs> so... Um, but I've, like I said, we've never had anybody, they went in there and said, well, um, yeah, this one's bad. Uh, get ready. You know? <laughs> Darren, that happens all the time in business. I mean, oh, you know, wow. in, in business and organizations, uh, it happens all the time, but uh, of course, very few people go through that kind of training anyway, right? Uh, very few of us ever, ever go through Navy SEAL training. Uh, <laughs> hey, Darren, the, let me ask you this. Uh, Obviously, you have to be in, in enormous uh, physical shape to even get through just the, the, the basic stuff, all the push-ups you do and all that. Uh, but, and then, of course, you have to have mental strength. Mm -hmm. Can a, uh, a young person today be an elite warrior, whether it's SEALs or, or other special forces, without learning or being a good communicator as well? It's not just um, physical and skill, right? I mean, it would have to, you'd have to be a good communicator to be a good leader. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You have to be uh, absolutely hundred percent. Yeah. Communication is everything. Um, and this is something I taught you. We, we, of course we communicate all the time in the SEAL teams. Um, but I think what you're talking about is a bigger, is a bigger issue we have in our society right now is people are losing the ability to communicate you know, because they go straight to a device and that's it, you know, and then that's, they walk that around and, and it's like, they forget to talk to people. And we, we've had that in the SEAL teams. It's like, you, we get there, we got these new guys coming in. I'm an older guy and they're just sitting around on, on, on their, on their devices talking. And, and that's, that's bad. We have a culture that I truly believe that does not know how to communicate anymore. And, and I've so that, that from other military yeah, units too, that, that changes our whole like we said, the battle space has changed and how we even communicate with this younger generation, you know, and, and it's hard because uh, that's what they've grown up with is just like talking on a device or shall we say texting um, and using like the little emoji cons for everything. And that's the way they communicate. So how do you break that down and get our military roles and what you do and, and build them back up again? So what we're doing is we had to do is we get, we had to break them down. It's like, as a matter of fact, break them down to the point you can't even have uh, your device anywhere in the SEAL teams. It has to be in your locker locked up. It can't even be up to Spoon Space or anything so, else. So I, you... I, can't, I can't tweet and post Instagram <laughs> during Hell Week? No, you can't do it. There, it's all, all the phones are put away, and you, know, you can have it at night, and, uh, and, but that's it. But uh, it, it's definitely a challenge as we move forward with being able to communicate. It's like you know, we, we've got uh, this generation that doesn't even know how to, to make a phone call. 
you know, <laughs> you know, and, and it's, it's like, oh man, how are you going to communicate effectively and talk to people to, to get your message through or the job that we have to do if you don't even know how to talk to your people, yeah. you know, and it's one of, one of the big things leadership is like, how can you lead your people if you don't know your people, you know, and so you got to start knowing your people and you got, and, and you have to adapt too and figure out ways how we can move forward with that. And, uh, and that's probably one of the biggest challenges uh, in the later half of my career. And even, even now with the generation is how do you effectively communicate? It's a huge challenge. It, it, it's a massive challenge in a lot mm -hmm. of organizations I speak to. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Um, yeah. which is why I, I do like writing about it uh, and, and reminding people of what real leadership is, especially young entrepreneurs and aspiring leaders. Uh, communication is everything. So mm -hmm. let's put away the phone when you are, yeah when you're in a job interview, yeah. or especially if you're an aspiring leader giving presentations, right? Yeah. I'd say if you're an aspiring leader doing presentations, the last thing you want to do is be up there walking around with a, with a phone in your hand, oh. you know? So yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, I spoke to a cognitive psychologist uh, a few weeks ago and just having the phone in your presence is a distraction. Yes. So you'll look down all the time, right? I, I've had so many, even leaders, uh, and executives who I'm speaking to and they're looking at their phone and you know, they're talking mm -hmm. to me while they're looking yeah. at the phone and I'm a guest. So with their employees, mm -hmm. they're even more casual. That's not effective leadership. Mm -hmm. Eye contact, basic stuff. Yeah. yeah, it is basic. And, 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 uh, and there's no such thing as multitasking. There is no such thing. You either, your, your mind is either here or it's there. It's, it can't be both places, you know? So, um, I, like I say, we talk about, I, I gave a speech and it was about, uh, it was, it was about 500 of them in there and, you know, kept the CEO, the president and like 500 of their top employees in there. And, you know, and I was just walking around and I was talked, I was really talking about effective communication and, and, and how we move forward with it. And so, like I said, I, uh, at one point on that stage, I just stopped and I went over the podium, I grabbed my phone and I, I did one, one lap back and forth on the stage, you know, and I, I said, uh, I said, how do you feel about me right now? You know, and they're all like saying, it was like, well, you don't really care because now you got the phone in your hand. So that's more important. It's like, yeah, exactly. So why does every one of you have your phone right in front of you? <laughs> yeah. You know, so real, real briefly, Darren, yes. uh, Uncommon Grit, what is the, tell us about the Uncommon Grit Foundation. Oh, yeah, the, uh, uh, the Uncommon Grit Foundation is a foundation that, um, that uh, me and my wife started uh, because Uncommon Grit over these last two or three years has become its own brand. And, uh, and of course that brand is like uncommon characteristics. And so, because it became a, its own brand, we just uh, decided to start our own, ch our own charity, which is called Uncommon Grit Foundation, you know, to help those who helped us, you know, and that's what I really talk about. You can't do it alone. And so we have this, uh, we have this uh, protection around us that, that people are obligatory to, you know, it's like you, when you go to work and you go to your job and you're, you're successful or not successful, do the things you get to do, you didn't do it alone. It's like you had police officers out there protecting you. You had the military out there protecting you. And if you want to call somebody because your life's in peril, you need a, if you, if uh, uh, a situation is coming that you need help, there's going to be people that you don't know, that you don't know their families, you don't know anything about them are going to come and they're going to help you. And it's our job as Americans, make sure that, that they're taken care of because they're out there protecting us and we know, we know they're out there, but we don't really think about them. And so for us, we, you know, we're raised money to help uh, fallen firefighters, fallen police officers, fallen military, help their families who have paid the ultimate sacrifice uh, move forward or, or give that money to vetted charities that can help, that, that can help them deal with, you know, uh, legs being amputated, uh, PTSD, uh, things on that nature. I just say we're just another dog in the fight. You know, and one of the biggest things we learned in the SEAL teams is, hey, you know, uh, take care of those who took care of you. And just because we're, we're out on the military anymore, uh, the mission doesn't stop. We're still going to have your back when, when you get back the best we can. But it's incorporated all our first responders because they're out there doing a hell of a job. And I just don't think that we do enough to make sure that, uh, that they're taken care of um, if they do pass away uh, during their jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, lo I love the way you end it. You've got some great words, a, a, a quote, never underestimate yourself. Yeah, I like that. Those are powerful <laughs> words. I think uh, we should all have on the wall somewhere. So I, I will put this on my permanent bookshelf. Uh, oh, thank or, you. Or maybe even do something better. See, you can't see it, but when you walk into my office, maybe I'll put it right up front. So when people walk in, they'll know this is serious. 
Oh, guys. well, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it's an honor. Thank you so much. Especially for someone like you, you've got so many great books out there. I'm like, oh man, you know, to have mine with yours. It's uh, it's, it's, that's, uh, that's a true honor. Thank you. Well, I write, but you take those beautiful photographs. So, <laughs> thank <laughs> uh, you. so thank you, Darren. I, I pre- it's an honor. Thank you for your service and thank you for your time. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.